Usually when people introduce me, the first thing they say is, okay, how many drones have you crashed, okay? So let's get that out right now. I've crashed a few, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Curtis, you also stole a little bit of my thunder. Unmanned aerial, aerial vehicles, unmanned aerial systems is, is what uh, some people like to call these things. I like drones because drones is easier to say to begin with, okay? But why don't people, in some circumstances, some situations, why don't people want us using the word drone? What do you guys think? Certain connotations. Military connotations? Something like that? Now I'll tell you guys, I've got a farm, I've got a groundhog issue. There's the answer. I'm not sure, my, not sure my neighbors would like that, but there's the answer, okay? Also, I'm gonna have one of these flying over here in just a little bit. Anybody in the back row, you might wanna duck. You might wanna move forward. Just kidding, just kidding. Okay, so Curtis asked me to come in here and talk about drones and you know, where we're at with them, uh, maybe what we're doing, what's coming next, and you know, kinda of looking at that crystal ball. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit today. In some of our meetings over the last five years, or last five years, last two years, uh, winter meetings, we've uh, surveyed farmers that came to those meetings, talking, asking them about where they're at with drones, okay, trying to get a better feel for that. I've worked with drones myself for about six years now, and this is kind of what we came up with. And again, this is just about a three county area um, for the last couple winters. But the folks that we interviewed, 13% of them are using drones right now, okay? 8% plan on using them sometime this year. 18%, yeah, probably maybe within the next five years I'll get a drone and try to do something with it. So that's uh, roughly about 40% that may or may not use a drone. Yeah? How many you interviewed? How many were in that? Uh, just shy of 300. So, you know, it's just about a year and a half worth of, worth of questions and, and kind of a small sample size out of a three county area. Yeah, in central Ohio. Yeah, I'm based out of Knox County, so it's Knox, Delaware, and uh, Morrow counties that we do a lot of programming together in those counties. Yep. Um, about a third of them, drones aren't for them. We're not going to use them, okay? And again, just shy of a third, not real sure yet. We'll see how this all shakes out. Of the ones that uh, are thinking about using a drone, we want to know how they were going to use it, you know. Okay, if you've got one, how are you using it? If you're thinking about it, you know, what do you guys want to do with the drone? 63% uh, a big majority there are using it or plan to use it for some sort of scouting purposes. And we see that a lot of guys I know that have drones, that's the big thing what they're doing right now is, is using that to scout with, okay. 19% of them are going to do some sort of imagery, whether it's infrared or something like that. 12% uh, some sort of video, you know, whether that's live video. Um, Nobody is going to apply inputs with it right now. Yes? Why is that? The inputs? Why, why aren't they being used as a tool to guide the climate? Yeah, and we're going to come to that in a minute, but basically it comes down to two things in, in my mind. Number one, is your drone capable of doing that from a weight issue and a battery standpoint? And number two, you've got reg regulations uh, as far as you've got to have a special pilot's license and you have, have to have a special applications license as well. Okay, so you're talking about a carry. You're carrying the product and making an application. Yes. Yes. Oh no, that's that's definitely happened. Yes. Yep. Yep. And that kind of falls in that other category, doing some mapping and making some other decisions based off of that. Um, so yeah. Yes. Other questions. Okay. For the guys that aren't thinking about using a drone, you know, tell us why. What are you guys thinking? Um, you know, is it cost, your return on investment? 27% uh, thought it was a cost issue, okay? Almost a third, 29% uh, regulations. You know, we've got all these regulations. I may have to get my, my drone pilot's license, you know, things like that. They may restrict how I can fly. So 29% of that's regulations, okay? Um, drone performance. Do we have issues with drones flying? I've crashed a few. Heard a few flying away. That doesn't happen so much anymore. But you know, five, six years ago, drones taking off and kind of doing their own thing was a lot more common than it is right now. And there are just some guys that just, hey, that technology, that's not for me. Okay, and we and we see some of that. I stole this this slide from one of Dr. Shear's presentations, but it kind of fits where I think the drone uh, technology and stuff is right now. Um, and this, I apologize, this is a little small type for you guys in the back. 
Um, but basically, when you get a new technology, and I can't point with this thing, you get a new technology, a new idea, you kind of start off here at the bottom, and then, you know, hey, gosh, that's the greatest thing since sliced bread. So you start up this hype curve, okay? You get up to that peak, and you think, wow, maybe this isn't quite as good as what we think it is. Okay, so you start coming back down towards the trough of disillusionment, and you can see the definitions up there. We kind of get stuff figured out, stuff starts shaking out. People start using them more, we get the bugs worked out, and then you get over in this area. Uh, for example, you'll see auto steer over here. You know, we'd be hard pressed to find a farmer now who, if he had a choice, wouldn't want auto steer on his tractor. So where are drones at in that? You know, on this slide they had them, you know, right in here. Reality, they're probably somewhere more down in here. Uh, if, I, if I was doing it, that's where I'd put it. Um, you, can see the, uh, you can see the definition up there, you know, the peak of inflated expectations. You know, gosh, that thing's great. Everybody wants to get one. You know, when drones first came out, what did we read in most farm magazines, most publications? That stuff's going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread, right? Everybody in the world is going to own one, okay? Well, we're not quite there yet. We had a lot of failures. Some companies dropped out, you know. Uh, we don't have as many drone companies now as we did at one point in time. But as that starts to level off, okay, and as we start, as those drones start meeting our expectations, then we'll start back up this curve. Here's some of the drones that I've worked with. Um, there's five of them up there. Out of those five, how many do you think have crashed on me? Five? Well, you don't have a lot of great expectations about my flying ability, do you? <laughs> okay, five, who else? Anybody else have a different number? Come on, you're not gonna hurt my feelings. Two? Two? Okay, I like your thought a lot better. Okay. This one crashed, this one crashed, and this one crashed. Three of the five crashed on me, okay? Luckily, every time it crashed so far, it's been mechanical issues, not piloting issues. That will change someday, but so far, uh, those have been the issues with those, okay? This was the first drone I ever had, and I tell you, I really liked that one. If we could have kept that darn thing in the air, it did a lot of really neat stuff and was, was really good, but I don't know, they crashed six or seven times. I had three different models because it's, when they hit the ground, they don't do well, um, and we just couldn't keep that one in the air. But had that one, had they been able to figure that out, that drone had a lot of possibilities. Um, this is the main one I fly right now. It's a DJI drone. It does a fantastic job. Uh, the cameras on these things anymore are just amazing, okay? But if you look at that, we talk about where it's at on that hype curve and, you know, the ones that aren't doing well, they kind of, you know, that kind of all evens out. Some of those companies are out of business. These guys no longer make a drone. Better, better not touch the screen. These guys are no longer in business. These guys are no longer in business. Okay? These two, the ones that haven't crashed for me, I don't know if that's a coincidence or not, but those guys are still making drones. So that's kind of what we see. So, as I talk to farmers, Farmers that are interested in this technology, trying to figure out how they're going to use this in their operations. There's kind of a set of questions that we go through and talk about, okay? And the first thing I'm going to ask you is, what do you want to do with your drone? Why would that be important? Model. Determine what model I want to buy, what I'm going to do with that drone. That's exactly right. You know, what type of drone do I need? You've got basically two different types. You've got the airplane type and you've got the helicopter type. You've got advantages and disadvantages of both of them. But I need to know what I'm gonna do with that drone to decide which one of those is gonna be best for me. If my, if my plan is to cover as many acres in a day as I can, probably wanna think more about the airplane one. Um, it has some issues also though as far as how you're gonna get in the air and how you're gonna land it. The helicopter models, um, just the opposite. Their biggest issue right now is battery life. But I can take off and land just about anywhere I want. Um, I can do a lot more in-flight stuff with it too. If I see something I want to stop and hover and take a look at, I can do that. You know, I can fly a bunch of different heights very easily, change direction very easily. Uh, not quite so much with the airplanes. So that, that's a part of that decision we've got to talk about. What other equipment do we need? What other software do we need? Kind of goes back to that first question. What are we going to do with that drone and what's our plan? It's kind of like putting together a puzzle. You know, you start with your drone, you've got your controller over there, you got some sort of autopilot, don't fly without autopilot. I think probably the biggest reason why we don't have as many drone crashes as we used to is because of autopilot. That stuff does a fantastic job. 
you've got different cameras, different sensors, software. Um, is your computer big enough? Do you have enough hard drive to store all those images? And then all this stuff's got to talk together and all these pieces of the puzzle somehow got to fit. Do they or do they not? It just depends. But when you see the light, when those puzzle pieces start coming together, now you've got a system, something you can do a lot of work with, and they can do a lot of work for you. We also t need to talk about how much do you want to spend, okay? A package like we were just talking about before that comes with everything you need is going to be oftentimes more expensive than if you try to put it together yourself, okay? And do you have the technical ability to put that together for yourself? That's something you've got to talk about, something you've got to decide. Do you have the time or do you want to make the time to do it? Okay, because that can be kind of time consuming. Do you need a pilot's license? What other kind of regulations will affect what you want to do in that business? Do you need insurance? Okay, if you're a farmer, do you need insurance for that drone? You know, not only to cover the drone if it crashes on you, but what happens if you fly into the neighbor's truck, tractor, whatever, combine? Okay, do you need insurance? You need to have a conversation with that, with your insurance agent. Is that covered under your umbrella? Usually not, you may have to add a rider for that. Okay, but you need that, that insurance issue is something you really need to think about. You know, that's a $20,000 drone right there. That's what a $20,000 drone looks like when it falls 300 feet out of the sky. Okay, I can tell you that's one of the most helpless feelings in the world. When, when you've got this drone up there about 300 feet and you see it start to come down and you know that there's not a darn thing you can do about it. And it probably only took a few seconds for it to fall, but it seemed like it took forever because I'm sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, that's $20,000 and there's nothing I can do about it. I'm really glad that's not my drone, okay? But that's what it looked like. Of the parts that we could find when it hit, that's what it looked like, okay? So if that had been my drone, who's out $20,000? <laughs> probably me. Okay, so those things can happen for a variety of reasons. Okay, so let's talk about farmers that I'm working with and, and, and other folks I've talked to. How are they using it? 63% of the people we surveyed, I showed you the graph earlier, said they plan on using that for scouting. Okay, here's a yield map of a field. There's a mid-season drone map of that same field. You guys see any similarities? Okay, you can see something's going on here. Okay, you can see that same image right here in the darker color. Okay, lighter color here kind of corresponds to this area. And then this green strip that kind of shows up back here shows up right here on that yield map. Okay, so late July, we fly that field and we can tell something's going on there that definitely showed up on our yield maps in the fall. Okay, that gives us a reason to go back to that field to figure out what the heck's going on in that field. Okay, with a drone, depending on how much you trust your own flying ability, you know, you, you can fly right up to a plant, to a weed, and try to identify what that weed is, okay? Pretty easy to do. I could have been standing clear over here by this tree line and flown right up to that weed just like that to see what it is and make that identification if I wanted to. Works pretty decent on disease identification. You're a little bit higher up, obviously. But what do you guys think about identifying insects with a drone? Good, bad, you're shaking your head no. How come? There's too much crop wash. Yeah, and that soybean canopy is just going like this, and it's pretty hard to look and see an insect. When it, yeah, but they are coming out with some new cameras that have a zoom on them that can be controlled from your, from your remote control, and that will help for that. So there is, some, there is some, uh, something good coming with that that will, again, allow us to use that more in different ways. Um, but scouting is a big one. Picture's a little bit dark here, but this is a field that we were scouting last sum two summers ago. Okay, see we had some water issues that showed up in that field. We can also see sprayer tracks. What else do you notice on that field if you can see it? You see all these lighter specks throughout the field? Where do you suppose that is? That's the soybean field. Where do you suppose those, those lighter colored specks are? Okay, each one of those with a different weed. Okay, and as you drop down with your drone, get a little bit closer, you start to look at that and say, hmm. Get a little bit closer, you say, uh-oh. 
you get that close and say, oh, darn, I didn't want to see that weed. If you've never seen Palmer amaranth, there it is. Okay, and you can see there was quite a bit of that scattered throughout that field. And if, if you can see the light spots, you can see in this field where that was pretty well scattered through that entire soybean field. Also, a year like last year, you've got tile lines in your fields, you're not sure where those tile lines are. You know, as well as it was, as well as it was last year, I think we could see every tile line we ever had in the ground, okay? You could see them from the road, but if I wanted to document this now, I can fly up there with the drone, take a picture, and I've got a picture to document where those tile lines are, but also depending on what software I'm running, I can import that into my software and geo-reference that and have a map now with exact coordinates of where all those tile lines are. If I ever need that to go back to work on them, split them, you know, uh, add another main, whatever I need to do, I now have a map that will allow me to do that. These wet years have been a great, one of the only great things about them, but it's been great to be able to locate a lot of these tile lines. Found a lot of those in fields last, or last spring down around us. Um, real easy to see. What about imagery? Anybody doing any infrared? Any images? Anybody? You are? What are you, what are you looking at when you do your infrared? We're using, we're using satellite imagery, but we use infrared to look for plant health. Okay, yep. Here's a plant health uh, map, an infrared map of a soybean field, the farm I work with. Um, not to go in great detail about what all you're going to see here, but generally green's good. Yellow and red, orange not so good, and black's pretty bad, okay? So you can kind of see some stuff going on in this field, and if you look really closely and you know the field, you can kind of see some tile lines running through here as well uh, in the background. The main thing that we've learned from infrared is that that's a picture of a field at one specific point in time, okay? I told you the green's good and black's bad. What part of this field do you think yielded the best? Anybody want to guess? Come on. Some, what part of the field do you think yielded the best? When we took this field to yield, infrared image, green's good, black's bad. Up in the corner of the green, you think yielded the best? I heard somebody else say black. Center. Why? Okay. As I said earlier, infrared is a shot at one exact point in time. Okay. We flew these soybeans right around R3, R4, so early on in the growing season. We had some stand issues in this field, in the soybean field, okay, but early on. But what, are, what can soybeans do? They can bush and they can compensate tremendously. Okay. And that's exactly what happened. And actually, this part of the field out yielded this part by about seven bushels when it was all said and done, okay? So again, just the, the key thing there is that's a certain point in time. Now that's not always the case. Oftentimes, that's gonna be the poor yielding part of the field, but it depends on when you took it and what was going on in that field. How much does it affect that with cloud cover? Does cloud cover is huge. It takes you a certain amount of time to fly that, especially in big fields. How are you getting Yeah, consistent? I could fly that in a little bit less than a half an hour, but the, Cloud cover is an issue, and the angle of the sun is something else that you have to watch when you're doing that. So, you, yeah, before you just go out, especially if you're doing infrared, you can't just go out and fly whenever you feel like. Um, so you've got to kind of take that into effect. Okay, where are my clouds? Because those shadows totally throw that out. What so, distances they have on some of these, like the Peregrine or some of the other ones? Are those legit? Or are they still not giving you a... There's two issues on those. One, they say they're legit. I haven't used one. But I still got to think, unless they, if there's a cloud issue there, how are they compensating for that? How do they know exactly what that cloud issue is? So I still have some concerns with that. Some of these other companies out there, and they're using algorithms just based off a different video, not infrared stuff. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to experiment with some of that this year, but I've got some concerns there too. How accurate are those algorithms really are? But then you go back to, okay, how accurate does that need to be? Because with that image, what am I going to do? I'm going to take that image to go back to the field to see what's going on. So if it's off just a little bit, is that acceptable? And that's kind of really what we're looking at there. Yeah, Randall. So is that a stitched picture? This one is stitched, yes, because um, you can see a stitch mark here and a stitch mark there. Yeah, that was three flights because of battery life. Yeah. 
Yep, same field, but three different flights. Other questions? Okay, here's another field. We can see some, especially you guys in the front, we can see some cupping issues on these soybeans, right? Probably got some issues going on in that field. Um, that's from a, a video that we flew over that field and we saw that cupping in there. Came back with a plant held with an infrared image. And again, green's good, the rest isn't. And you can kind of see stuff not so good over in here and got really bad right in here. And then it stopped, this is the way this field is formed. Kind of stopped here and it got good again. What do you suppose happened in that field? Say it again, please. Issue. Yeah, this was a dicamba issue, dicamba clean-out issue. <coughs> Excuse me, in a farmer sprayer. He started spraying on this side of the field, came across. He hadn't done a good job cleaning out his tank, okay? You can see where he's getting to the bottom of the tank. Right here, he runs out, goes to the farm, fills up, comes back with a new tank, and he's pretty well flushed it out by then, okay? And if you're in the front, you can kind of see the cupping on some of these beans, okay? How do you suppose that field yielded? Pretty good. Pretty good. Actually, the part of the field where the beans were cupped out yielded the others by about three bushel. Kind of remind you, anybody used Cobra, spray Cobra before back in the day? Kind of remind you of the Cobra effect a little bit. This is one of my favorite ones here. Okay. Well, what do you guys think is going on in that field? What's the first thing you notice? Green stripes, right? Okay, what do you think those green stripes are? Wheel tracks, right? I looked at that and I thought, oh man, look at all those tire tracks. But why would tire tracks be good? Why would that make that look like the good part of the field? Usually when you see tire tracks, that, that's hurt the plant, right? And I looked at that for quite a while because I thought the same thing. It's got to be tire tracks. What the heck is going on? And then, I don't have a pointer, but then I saw this spot right up here. Okay, unless I had major, major issue there with a piece of equipment, tire tracks aren't going to split like that, right? That's a power pole right there, and you can, if you look hard, you can kind of see the power lines right there and run at an angle. That's a power pole, okay? So I took that map out to the farm. I said, what's going on? He starts laughing. I said, well, here's the deal. It's the last field I had to put 28 on. It's getting ready to rain. Okay. I pulled out of the field right before this one, clipped the telephone pole with my boom, and tore the nozzle off the end. Stopped at home on the way, on the way to this field, just threw on any old nozzle and took off and went to spray. And look what happened. So what's really the question we should be asking on this map? What the heck was that rate? Because we should have put it on the whole field, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay, so what's next in the few minutes here I've got remaining? What, that's kind of how we're using it. That's kind of where we are. What's next? Okay. We talked a little bit ago about applying inputs. Uh, if anybody was out at Farm Science Review, uh, you saw Dr. Fulton and Bex had, some, had uh, a drone out there that they were doing some spraying demo, demo, <coughs> demonstrations on. And you can do this, okay? There's some folks in Ohio that, uh, there's one down by us that just uh, completed the training. You gotta have a special pilot's license. You gotta have a special application uh, permit to do that. It also has to come from the EPA because of the aerial application. But it can be done. Issues, again, how many acres can you cover? Because, again, when you've got extra weight in that tank, that reduces your battery life. How, and how much weight can you really put on there to begin with? So you don't have, you can't cover a real big area uh, without stopping quite often. But in other countries, they're doing quite a bit of this, okay? We get the battery life thing figured out. We get bigger, bigger drones maybe for that special purpose. Maybe this will change, but we don't see a lot of this right now. What about drone swarms? Anybody heard of drone swarms? Okay, where you get a whole bunch of them flying around. Okay, let's see if I can make this work. Anybody watch the Olympic Winter Olympics a few years ago? Okay, we'll get through the Olympic commercials here for a minute.
right there, that snowboarder guy. Those are a whole bunch of different drones with lights on them, okay? All being pre-programmed from the ground. And they go from that Do their moving around stuff to that. Okay? Pretty cool, right? Now, but envision that over your field. What if we got a whole bunch of those drones like that flying over our fields making some sort of application? Now we don't have to maybe necessarily worry about how much weight they can carry and, and how often they have to stop and fill and how long their battery is going to last if we've got a whole bunch of them doing it. We can still do a field pretty quickly, maybe. <coughs> Maybe. That's one possibility. Plant pollination. Can we use a drone to pollinate some plants? We hear a lot about there being issues with the bees and all the bees are dying. There's research right now going on in, in Japan where they're actually using small drones to come up and pollinate plants and they're able to do that without any damage. Okay? Maybe something coming down the road. And I'll kind of end, end with this slide. This is kind of where, where my interests are, and I think sensors, to me, makes a whole lot of sense in some of these drones. And if you just think for a minute about what all we could do with a sensor on a drone, okay? What if I could fly over a pasture field or a hay field, and I have a sensor on there that's gonna tell me the exact perfect day to cut that hay, okay? I've still gotta deal with rain and that kind of stuff, but, okay? What if I could fly over a cornfield Okay? See a weed problem and have that create a post-emergence herbicide application for me. Okay? Send that directly to a sprayer. Maybe it's the entire field, maybe it's just portions of that field. What if I had a sensor on there that could fly over soybean field, create an application map for an insecticide rescue treatment? Again, maybe the whole field, maybe just part of the field. Okay? But I've got a sensor that can do that. What if I can fly over a cornfield? Late season, and determine does this corn, does this season justify maybe 10, 15 more gallons of nitrogen at the end of the season? Economics, what's the weather look like? What's the corn plant look like? Is there enough nitrogen there? Do I have a sensor that could deter help me determine some of that? What if I could fly over a field, have a sensor drop in that canopy and kind of make a predictive map about disease potential, measuring what's going on within that canopy? Looking at the weather forecast, okay, would a fungicide application as a preventative, would that be a good thing? Would that make us some money this year based off the, based off the current conditions? You know, do we have a sensor that could do that? What if I had one sensor that could do all of that in one flight? Okay, one trip. Okay, again thinking into the future. And what if perhaps I had a sprayer sitting there ready to spray that field that could take the information from that sensor and maybe that sprayer has multiple bins on there, multiple tanks, and it could make all those applications in one pass based off of that drone data, drone sensor data. Or what if that sensor data could send, send that to that swarm of drones that's waiting to come in there and do all that? You know, down the road, is this going to work out? Questions? Yeah. Um, have you, did, did you do a correlation between your uh, aerial image that you had out of that field and, and the crop canopy and yield? How close did you put correlation? Yeah, pretty, pretty close. Depend, oh. And again, depending on time of year, when that was taken. But yeah, w within 5%, very easily. Yeah. And again, you got to have a good image to, to get that close. You know, if I have a cloudy day or, or, or sun angles, sun angles are a lot bigger issue than what we really realize. Question over here. How are like retailers taking this and turning it into a problem? So we've been down this route. We've had drones. We've looked at buying very expensive drones, but thank God we didn't because now they're out of, <laughs> they're out of business. Been there. Yep. Obsolete. Yeah. We had uh, we went through the training, got all the pilots licenses. Yep. Yep. You help a farmer find the lost calf. You look at something that we knew was already a problem, but let's look at it from another angle. 
how do you turn that into a profit? Because it's a huge expense. A pilot license is not cheap. Right. Drones are not cheap. You got to renew that license every two years. Insurance. Yep. I mean, but. Yeah. So now we, I mean, I've got one sitting on the floor in the office. Yep. It's been there since harvest. Yeah. I mean, we used it to fly to take a picture of the combine. That's, that's what we <laughs> yeah. Making videos, playing with the right. kids. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's yeah. Now we've got a lot of money wrapped up into something that we can't figure out how to turn profit. And you, to get a profit with that, where we're at right now, we talked about that curve and where we're at on that curve. To make a profit from that, you've got to have this guy with his farm or this gal with her farm or this guy with his farm. They've got to see value in that data and how you're going to do that. And right now, it is tough. Okay, right now it is tough because how do we have the ability to take that data and go out and make a treatment? Okay, a lot of guys may or may scout their field on their own. They may have somebody scout their field instead. Um, maybe they don't trust that technology yet, but right now that's a tough business to be in. And it's it, been a good tool, so we don't have to scout the whole field. Oh, absolutely. You still have to have boots on the ground. Because we've been to Syngenta, they promised last year, two years ago, a, a platform where they're going to give their retailers. It's not there. Gonna, it's going to look for bugs. It's going to look for disease. It's going to create a, a map. It's going to yeah. create a solution for us to take our customers, and that's falling through the cracks. And I really think. <laughs> Just my opinion, I don't think that's going to be the answer. I think the answer will be that sensors or something like that that's going to go through and do that, and we're not there yet. And I don't know that we're real close, but I think someday we'll see that. Okay. Yeah. But I see that's where, that's where I think it's going to go.